last class we were talking about how we can use different ways to record the correct value of cost of goods sold and inventory. And in that we found uh, that there is an argument that can favor the first in first out and also a possible argument that can favor a last in first out. While both of them are correct methods to record cost of goods sold and inventory. Now, let us see what will be the argument that favors first in first out. First in first out, the assumption is the inventory that gets acquired first gets used first and gets sold first. So, that is the first in first out logic. Now, why is that favored over the last in first out? One is for a purpose of accounting, it is more accounting than conceptual that this first in first out captures the correct value of inventory that you see in your balance sheet. See in your balance sheet you see that there is some value against inventory. And as somebody using the balance sheet, I would want the value of the inventory to be most recent and exact. Now, this first in first out will capture the inventory that is not used in its recent cost of acquisition because what gets used is the inventory that was purchased some time back, which does not sit in your balance sheet any longer, but because it gets consumed and it goes as cost of goods sold. So, what sits in your balance sheet need not be the most recent, but definitely not the first. So, it gives a fairer estimate, more correct value of the inventory, because it is not the one that was purchased first. It is not, I am not saying that it is the most recent, it will also include inventory that was purchased the most recent, but then the C4 captures the correct value that is a, a correct estimate of the value of the inventory in your balance sheet, because always I am more interested in knowing what is the fair estimate of my asset items in the balance sheet. This is one accounting justification. Another thing is if I use first in first out, there is more likelihood that it maximizes the net income. Why? Because it is very unlikely that the cost of inventory reduces, there are cases, but in a majority of the circumstances that we handle, we have always found that the cost of inventory, the cost of certain material, the cost of acquisition has always increased year on year, at least to cover inflation. So, when the cost of inventory increases year after year, if you use the first in first out method, what sits in your cost of goods sold is that value that would have used the maximum inventory that was purchased first, right? because it is first in first out. And because the cost of inventory is rising over the accounting period, in all likelihood the cost of goods sold will be lesser than it would have been had you adopted last in first out, because in that case the cost of goods sold would have recorded the cost of acquisition at higher acquisition prices, thereby reducing your net income. So, these two broadly are arguments that favor the use of C4 method. Likewise, there are also arguments that support that I should use last in first out. One relates to your principle of matching. Principle of matching says revenue versus expenses 
in a recording revenues in this particular accounting period, you have to take into account the cost related cost to this particular accounting period. And if it is a revenue that has happened at this time instant x, you have to necessarily take into the inventory that was purchased in the vicinity time period x, fair enough. Another second thing is it reduces taxable income, why? Because higher cost of goods sold, though it reduces your net income, the profit before tax is also relatively less and hence your income tax that you need to pay is less, your taxable income is reduced. So, these are two things, two points that favor the use of LIFO over FIFO, but I already told you that the most popular method that is used is the first in first out, not that it is the only correct method that is the most popular method. Now, we have covered revenues, we have covered cost of goods sold. The third thing that I said I will be discussing in class is the principle of depreciation and is there again different ways in which we can depreciate an asset. I have told you that depreciation is an expense which is non-cash because cash does not really flow out of the entity and it is an expense because we have to charge the entity for using an equipment that gets depreciated. Typically assets are of two types, tangible and intangible assets. Your tangible assets are your land, building, equipment and all that. Your intangible could be your patents, goodwill, trademarks. So, such non-physical assets are your intangible assets and we depreciate tangible assets and the equivalent for intangible assets is what we call as amortization. Now, when we depreciate an asset, I have told you in the previous classes that it is only the capital expenditure that creates an asset that gets depreciated, not the revenue expense because that gets written off in that particular year. So, when an asset is depreciated, it means that we are charging the entity some expense for using that particular asset for that particular accounting period. So, which means when you do depreciation, there is a depreciation expense. And how does that get charged? Suppose the cost of acquisition of the asset is x and let us say the life of the asset is 10 years, then the annual depreciation expense is the annual depreciation expense is x by 10. So, every year in your income statement you would have a depreciation expense of x by 10 and in your balance sheet that corresponding x by 10 gets reduced in the value of the asset cost of x. So, you will have x accumulated depreciation x by 10. So, the final book value of the asset will be 9 by 10 of x. Then in the second year, my it will be 2 x by 10. So, it keeps on reducing year after year while the annual depreciation expense is x by 10. Now, what do you depreciate? You depreciate the cost of acquisition. At times, you might even have a residual value for the asset. Residual value means the residual value is suppose after the lifetime of the asset, it can be sold for a particular value x, then that x is the residual value. In this case, for the sake of easy understanding, let us say it can be sold for y, then y is the residual value. Then what 
has to be depreciated is x minus y. If residual value is y, the depreciation x minus y has to be depreciated or depreciable. I do not know whether that is a term that is commonly used, but let us say for understanding f. So, the value to be depreciated it is this that gets depreciated over a 10 year period. So, the question is are there just as we saw cost of goods sold different ways are there different ways in which assets can be depreciated. Yes, there are and I am just going to deal with two such methods. One is your straight line method, which is just a linear depreciation and another method that is called the years digit method. A straight line and years digit. So, these two are the depreciation methods that we will be seeing. For let us say for an illustration that I purchase an equipment that is worth 1000 rupees and the estimated life of the equipment is 10 years and it has no residual value, the residual value is 0. So, what do we do? So, we are in year 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let us say I, I have a straight line method of depreciation here. So, in a straight line method, what is my annual depreciation? It is 100. So, every year it is 100. Why? Because the cost of acquisition is annual depreciation. cost of acquisition is 1000 and uh, residual value is 0 and it is a 10 year lifetime. So, the annual depreciation is 100. What is the net book value? At year 0, we just purchased it. I mean, we just purchased the net book value is 1000 and finally, it drops by 100 every year. This net book value at the end of the last year is 0. This is a very straightforward case. This is a straight line method of depreciation. The next thing is called the years digit. Now, in a years digit, the depreciation rate is no longer linear. We are not adopting a straight line method, we are not hence taking a linear rate of depreciation in this case it is 10 percent every year. Then what is the rate that is adopted? The depreciation, depreciation rate is a fraction that is calculated by one particular method. In this case it is 10 years. So, let us say the we call it the sum of the years digits. In 10, 10 years means n into n plus 1 by 2 is 55. How did we get this? 10 into this I call the sum of the years digit S by D. And this forms the denominator and the rate depreciating rate is calculated this way. So, the denominator is the sum of the digits 55 that is constant. In the numerator it is 
n that is the total life of the asset. So, the rate of depreciation for the first year is n by 55, for the second year it is n minus 1 by 55, for the third year it is n minus 2 by 55 and likewise it keeps dropping down. So, the rate of depreciation keeps changing in this particular fashion. and so on till you get 1 by 55 here. Now, what will be your annual depreciation in this case? Ten by fifty five of thousand one eighty one point eight two. Then what is your net book value? At year zero it was thousand, now it becomes eight one eight point one eight. And in the second year your annual depreciation becomes one sixty three point six four nine by fifty five times thousand. So your net book value is this minus this. So, third year your annual depreciation 145.45, your net book value is 509.09, likewise this also keeps on dropping and you will see in the uh, ninth year you will have the uh, annual depreciation as 36.36. Eighteen point one eight, and here the depreciation is eighteen point one eight, and the net book value is zero. In both these cases, the net book value at the end of the life of the asset is zero. Now, what makes the difference? The difference is that the annual depreciation in the case of the straight line method is hundred. In the case of the uh, years digit method, keeps changing. Now, why is this relevant for our discussion? Now, if you try to plot a graph between the year and the method that you actually adopt to calculate the annual depreciation. Now, the annual depreciation if I use the linear method 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, let us say it was 180 here, continues to be 100. Suppose it is sum of the years digits 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, you would find that somewhere between, suppose I fill all these details 127.27, here it is 109.09 then 90.91, 72.73, You find that between the fifth and sixth year that the annual depreciation expense, which was higher till the fifth year in the sum of year digit method, gets below 100 during the fifth year and sixth year period. So, somewhere here it crosses. here. Why is this important? It is important because from a reporting point of view, I might desire to get advantages of a reduced taxable income because of an increased depreciation expense for the first 5 years. If you look at this, the first 5 years I have the depreciation expense more than 100. Now, here are two options that is available, one annual depreciation expense of 100, in the other case the first 5 years the annual depreciation expense is more than 100 and I decide to choose this, why? Because I receive accelerated 
benefits of higher depreciation expense which reduces my taxable income. What will I do after 5 years? I switch over to straight line method, it is allowed. Because remember when we discuss the principle of consistency, though it says that you follow the same method that you are adopting, if at all you are making a change, you just have to be reasonable in explaining why you are making this change. In this case, it is reasonable to say that 5 years I have followed some of years digits, so that I get the benefit of the reduced taxable income ahead of time. And then after the 6th year, whatever is the remaining depreciable amount, I depreciate it over a straight line method. And just I have to, while I file my income statement and balance sheet, I just have to explain that I am shifting my sum of years digit method to a straight line method. And then for the remaining 5 years, you can continue to follow the straight line method of depreciation. So, these are the three special cases that I thought you should be knowing and of course, as I told you before, there are other special cases that can add more complexity to this subject, but we are not going to dwell on those special cases. I am sure all of you, you will feel little comfortable when it comes to understanding and interpreting a financial statement and then you will know what has happened behind the screens that create this financial statement. And that is where you will begin to appreciate the entire concept of accounting, the principles of accounting, the principle of duality, the debit, credit, T accounts, journalized, why did I do this, why was expenses recorded this way, why not this way, how sales is recognized, how cost of goods sold is being calculated. So, all these conceptual understanding is what that I gave you in the last 14, 15 classes. And with that conceptual understanding, you will be able to prepare a balance sheet, an income statement and a cash flow statement. You will be able to identify relevant activities and measure those activities in monetary terms and communicate in monetary terms by adopting a uniformly followed practice and in the process, you would have created a balance sheet, an income statement and a cash flow statement. Now, the exercise does not stop there. After you have created a balance sheet, an income statement and cash flow, and of course, I told you why we do this. Financial accounting is little different from management accounting, because the users of the information that comes out of financial accounting is not only those inside the organization, but also those outside the organization. It could be your bankers, it could be your shareholders or whoever they are. So, that is one main reason why financial accounting gains importance. So, it is not just that you prepare this and then your job is over. After I prepare, what am I going to do? to these financial statements, can I understand what these financial statements mean? I will be able to understand them and add more sense to these financial statements. If I start analyzing these statements by calculating certain set of ratios, and these ratios can explain whether my firm is liquid enough, if I calculate the liquidity ratios, whether there has been efficiency in terms of the activities that the firms engaged, I can calculate some ratios based on activity. To understand the leverage or the capital structure of the firm by calculating the debt equity ratios. To understand the profitability of the firm, I have some profitability ratios. Now, let us see how these ratios are important 
as a way to analyze these financial statements. Now, these ratios are important because looking at a financial statement, looking at balance sheet and income statement, it just tells me that cash is this much, inventory is this much, income is this much and all that. Now, if I am able to relate all those entries, these balance sheet figures and income statement figures and try to see whether there is some relationship between these or I am able to calculate some ratios based on these entries. I can make some fair judgment on the performance of the entity. And if I am able to do this for the previous year, the year before that, then I can also see how there has been a progress in the firm. Or if I am able to do this and compare this with my competitive firm's ratio, then I can know how I perform against competition. So, it is this performance of an entity based on these ratios becomes very important when it comes to using these financial statements to analyze them. Suppose I want to compare one ratio with the previous year's ratio, let us say current assets to current liabilities, it is 1.1.92. So, previously it was 1.1, now it is 0.92. What does it mean? It means that last year I had more current assets as a relative to current liabilities and this year I do not have enough current assets to cover my current liabilities. Have I done better? Looking at this ratio, I can say no, I have not done better because I do not have enough current assets to cover my current liabilities. Likewise, I calculate different ratios. Why? Because as I told you, it is not somebody inside the firm that is interested in doing this analysis. Since this becomes a public document, your annual report has this income statement balance sheet. Anybody can do this ratio analysis. As a shareholder, I will do the ratio analysis. As an investor, as a banker, as a member of the leadership team, as government, as anybody who can use this information, who thinks that this information is necessary, can do this ratio analysis. Now, let us begin with the liquidity ratio. Liquidity means how cash rich or cash poor the firm is. It refers to the solvency of an entity and also it means that how quickly can assets be converted and realized to cash with very minimum or in fact no loss in the value of the asset. If an asset can be converted with no loss, then it is the most liquid form of asset. The most liquid form of asset is cash by itself. So, liquidity measures the, the solvency of the firm. There are two ratios that actually explains the extent of liquidity of an entity. One is its current ratio, the other is the quick ratio. Current ratio is your current assets by current liabilities. By the way, current assets minus current liabilities is a net working capital. I have not explained to the class what working capital is because I do not think that is a subject matter for this course. I will be talking more about this in the next course, but it is enough for you to know that working capital is that finance that is required to meet your short term day to day requirements and it is for the purpose of easy calculation assumed to be net working capital is assumed to be current assets minus current liabilities. Now, current ratio is just current assets minus current liabilities. What does this mean? It just tells you the firm is solvent enough or is not solvent enough to cover its current liabilities. If the ratio is more than 1, which means you have enough current assets to meet your current liabilities. If it had been 2.1 last year, 1.3 this year, it means that from the solvency perspective, I view that the extent of liquidity has reduced as against last year, because my current assets which could cover 2.2 times the current liability is now able to cover only 1.3 or 1.4 times the current liability. 
but your current assets includes your cash, your accounts receivable, your inventories and in the order of liquidity priority, inventories is the one that probably takes more time to be converted into cash. So, I am not interested in actually having inventories as part of my current ratio because it is very difficult to convert inventories without reduction in value. So, I want to knock off inventories and then use another ratio that can explain the same solvency from a different perspective. So, if my current assets from my current assets I in remove inventory, current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities that is called the quick ratio. Again this is a liquidity measure, but then removes inventories and tells you the extent of solvency, how much of current assets minus the inventories that I have with me and how to what extent can it meet my current liabilities. So, this is the liquidity ratio. The next ratio is the activity ratio. The activity ratio is got to do more with the efficiency with which assets are being used and realized to generate sales and generate cash. So, this actually measures the speed at which assets are converted or utilized to generate sales and generate cash and what are these types of ratios. First is the inventory turnover ratio, cost of goods sold divided by inventory. How quickly is your inventory being converted into a saleable good? Another inventory, I mean the activity ratio is your average collection period. Average collection period explains the receivables management efficiency of the entity. Suppose in your balance sheet you have average, I mean you have your accounts receivable say x, that x divided by the total annual sales by 360, this annual sales by 360 is sales per day and your total accounts receivable divided by sales per day tells you on an average you have to wait for certain number of days before you get the real cash for the sale that you make. Now, how would that figure you would want it to be? The longer is your collection period, it means that you are poor in your receivables management. So, as much as possible, we need to have shorter collection period. Strictly speaking, that is why if you go to a, a restaurant business, it is hot cash, you eat something, you pay immediately, there is no collection period. As against a, a manufacturing entity where you allow credit 30 days, 60 days credit. So, the, act, the collection period, the longer or shorter explains how your receivables management as an activity is efficient. The longer it is, it is not that efficient. The shorter it is, it means that you have a better receivables management policy in place. Opposite to that is your average payment period, which has got to do with your vendors. The total accounts payable divided by the annual purchases or you could also use cost of goods sold instead. The average purchases you make every day and your total accounts payable. So, if you use these two numbers, you have a ratio expressed in days, you have a number expressed in days. This tells you that let us say if this is 20. It means for every dollar, every rupee that you purchase, you take 20 days to pay your vendor for that. And within allowable principles, if you are able to extend this 20 to 25 days, 30 days, then it is good to the firm because you are elongating the cash outflow. And this is opposite to the view that you take for receivables. The more and more you are able to stretch your payment period, the more and more you have internal cash accruals that can be deployed for other activities. Sales by net fixed asset tells you how quickly your asset is being utilized. This is an asset turnover ratio, how quickly you are able to utilize your asset to calculate sales. So, every 1 rupee of asset is generating some sales. The efficiency with which assets are being utilized to generate sales can be calculated using your fixed asset turnover ratio. 
if you include all the assets both your fixed and current assets it is just the total asset turnover, but both of them in principle conveys the same meaning the extent to which assets are being productively used to generate sales. So, this measures the activity of the firm all these activity ratios. The next ratio I have not spent a lot of time on this, but this we will be spending a lot of time when we actually do finance for engineers is to analyze the use of debt. Now, debt measures the extent of financial leverage. Every firm raises capital through different sources. The two most popular sources will be debt and equity. And based on the characteristic of the firm, the characteristic of the industry, you will find different firms in different industries having different debt equity ratios. So, you can never say that a debt equity ratio of 40 percent is the best. It could be best for a given context. You can never say that this is the right debt equity ratio, because it changes from industry across companies. Now, two things that we would be interested in measuring to see the, the debt ratio is first the extent of leverage of the firm, how much of debt it needs to be, it needs to pay and whether the degree of indebtedness, whether it is high or low considering the circumstances that the firm is operating. And the second thing is whether this firm is ability is the firm's ability to meet its debt obligations, whether it is able to service its debt. These I can calculate, I can make an assessment by calculating these ratios. First thing is a simple debt ratio of the total assets that you have created, total liabilities divided by total assets tells you the debt ratio of the total assets that you have created, how much has come from the liability. Debt equity ratio is out of the total capital that you have from which you have created this asset, how much is the debt component, how much is the equity component, 60 percent debt, 40 percent equity, 20 percent debt, 80 percent equity. This we will use when we actually calculate the optimum capital structure of a firm. When will you say that a firm is not optimally leveraged, either it could be under levered or over levered. Now, this ratio we will use to find the optimum capital structure of a firm, which tells you whether there is the right amount, the right mix of debt and equity that this firm has been utilized as a result of which the value of the firm is maximized. So, this ratio becomes important from that perspective. Times interest earned ratio is your, your earnings before interest and taxes. What is the earnings that you have before your interest and taxes? divide that by your interest. It tells you the propensity of the firm to meet its current debt obligations, whether it will be able to meet at least its interest obligations. So, this is a set of debt measures, the ratios that used to calculate the, the debt profile, the leverage, the financial leverage of an entity. The next important ratio is the profitability ratio. At the end of the day, everybody needs to know the net income that the firm is making. The profitability ratios, gross profit by sales, your gross margin by sales gives you the gross profit margin. Again, when we saw the income statement, I told you what the operating margin is, your operating profits or in this case the earning, earnings before interest and tax divided by sales gives you the operating profit margin. The net profit margin is your net income divided by sales, that is the profitability measure, net income divided by sales. Suppose I want to measure the return on assets for every dollar or every rupee of asset, how much is the return that I generate, then it is just your net sales, I mean net income divided by total assets. As a shareholder, I want to know the return on equity, it is just all the earnings that is available to the firm that needs to be dispersed to its shareholders divided by the number of, I mean the value of the total shareholders equity. 
So, that gives you the return on equity. So, the net income after taxes which is actually entirely the shareholders divided by the total value of the shareholders equity is the return on equity. The earnings per share again the net income that needs to be distributed to shareholder divided by the total number of shares outstanding in the firm. The P by E ratio is the price to earnings ratio is the, the, the market price of the common stock that is trading market price divided by the earnings per share that is the P by E ratio. So, these are all your profitability ratios. Another important ratio that you need to know is called the DuPont ratio which, which is more integrative and you will understand why I am saying this word integrative because it just dissects the financial performance into three identifiable ratios each of them important in their own way and then integrates all these three to arrive at a final ratio. Now, you see that the, the return on equity is a very, very important profitability ratio because the understanding is that the purpose of any firm is to maximize shareholders value. And one indicator that tells you yes, shareholder value is getting maximized is the return on equity. Now, that return on equity as I told you before, it is the, the net income divided by the total equity value. Now, that can be divided into three parts. One that explains the net profit margin. In this case, it is net income divided by sales. And then another important measure is how efficiently assets are being used to generate the sales and that you can measure by calculating the sales divided by the assets because that gives you the efficiency of the use of asset and that is called the asset turnover. And another thing is the extent of leverage and that you can measure by having a look at the total assets that you have created, how much has been because of equity. So, asset by equity that measures the extent of financial leverage. Now, all these three looked at individually are very important ratios. One net income by sales is a profitability ratio. Sales by asset is a productivity activity ratio which tells you about asset turnover. Asset by equity it is a leverage ratio. It tells you the extent to which debt and equity is being used. And each of them on their own are important ratios and all of them combined will explain the return on equity. So, if you are able to break the return on equity into these three parts and see the contribution of each of these ratios to the return on equity, you will be able to understand this concept a little better because then you will be able to know whether profitability can be improved, the asset turnover can be improved or we probably can change the capital structure. So, that the return on equity also improves. We are just dissecting the return on equity into these three important ratios. Not that these three are the only important ratios because all these three put together also forms return on equity which is also a very, very important indicator that speaks about shareholder value creation. So, DuPont ratio splits return on equity into these three parts to make an individual analysis integrating them to calculate the return on equity. So, what we have done during these classes is to understand financial accounting from the perspective of identifying activities within a firm that makes monetary sense and recording them in by following a set of principles that is uniformly accepted and then communicating that information by way of creating an income statement balance sheet and cash flow. And using these statements, we are able to make a judgment, we are able to make an analysis of the performance of the company. So, this is in a nutshell, in a single sentence, what we have done in these last 14, 15 classes. And I am sure you will now begin to appreciate the financial statements that you see. I am sure you will be able to identify activities within the firm and monetize them, record them based on some accepted principles. And when you do all of this meticulously, correctly, you will definitely be able to create your own, the firm's balance sheet, income statement 
and cash flow statements. So, next class we will be talking a little bit about management accounting, because accounting I said I will be dealing with financial and management accounting. In the next class we will be spending little time on management accounting, after which I will be concluding the chapters on accounting and then we will shift into strategy and economics. Thank you.